our God, our Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. So now in this moment, we look to you. God, we are powerless, but you are all powerful. Now in this hour, we are attempting something very great, to hear your word and to obey it. And as we attempt this, it's in the consciousness of our own inability. And so we depend fully and completely upon you, our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us even now. Amen. Let's open together to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to talk about our church's mission, making and training disciples who make and train disciples. We're going to talk about it right out of 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as we read this text in just a moment, as we read 2 Timothy 2 in just a moment, I think you will, upon reading it, agree with me that at least this week, I deserve a pay cut. Because if my job is to preach and teach from the Bible, and what makes preaching and teaching dynamic is two things, illustrations and applications. Illustrations that fire your imagination to help you picture and understand what's going on, and then applications that in a very uh, unignorable way just spin the truth right into your attitude and your actions. As we read this text in just a second, you're going to realize this text is basically a, a bunch of illustrations and applications. At least this week, my work was done for me. And I hope you'll also realize how important this is to speak about making and training disciples. And then there's the continuance to it who make and train disciples. Verse two in our text talks about the continuance of this thing that the next generation makes more disciples. Lord willing, I wanna slow down and focus on verse two next week. I wanna look at the whole thing today, but you can't help but see really what's more important than this. We are one, we are one generation away. If we confess and believe the gospel, but the next generation doesn't know it and doesn't understand it and doesn't pass it on, then we're finished. We're one generation away when it comes to love. If we love God and love others, but the next generation of disciples doesn't love God, doesn't love others, then there will be no a passion and heat here to keep things going and there'll be no love that that force almost like relational glue to pull people into the church so the church can stay healthy and vibrant and strong this is so important second timothy chapter 2 i'll read from verses 1 through 8 you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in christ jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, but his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. You see the illustrations, and then you see how each one comes with an application. So I want to show you these illustrations, and then for each one there will be a challenge, a challenge that will land right to you, where you're living, that you can put into your life uh, this very week. So let's roll through this. We'll start in verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The first illustration that we see is the endurance of a soldier. The endurance of a soldier. Share in suffering as a good soldier. If we were writing this text, we would say, find a way 
to avoid suffering. If God loves you, he'll figure out a way that you don't have to suffer so much. If typical American evangelicalism, whatever that means, was writing this text, it would say, um, it would say, expect no suffering. And if there is any suffering, get angry about it and lobby your representative about your hardship until it ends. But the text here says, share in suffering. The NIV translates it, endure hardship, the endurance of a soldier. And how we need to hear this injunction in this instant of our society's life, of our lives as women and men. God is not afraid to snap us to attention and say, hey, you need to be ready to suffer. This passage starts with grace. Verse one, you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This passage starts with grace and God says, I'm giving you the gift of my grace in salvation. And we say, yes. And then God says, and also, when I give you the grace of the gospel, with it comes your opportunity to advance the gospel by your own suffering. And we reply back to God, can I please have the first half, but I'd like to default on the second half of that plan. I don't want that suffering. But see, they both come together and the grace is sufficient for both of them. Suffering is all over this epistle, 2 Timothy. Paul was in prison when he wrote it. And when you, if you just scan through 2 Timothy and you pick out the proper names, most of the names that he mentions, it's so sad, most of the names that he mentions, he says, now that I'm in prison, this person turned out to be a false disciple. This person has forsaken me. This person has abandoned me. He was suffering. You see that theme in our text? You see it in verse 12 of chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I'm, I'm sharing the gospel. And he says in verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Suffering comes up in our text here in verse 3. Also in chapter 2, look down to verse 9 of chapter 2. He mentions the gospel. Gospel is the last word of verse eight. And then look what he says in verse nine. For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I endure suffering. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I love that. Paul says, I've been given sovereign grace for salvation by God's mercy, by God's sovereign act. And now I suffer because there are more persons who are elect unto salvation and it's my privilege to suffer to get the name of Jesus toward them and to them. And look at chapter three, what he says about suffering in chapter three, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10 of chapter three, you, however have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. So if Paul's teaching Timothy, say, I'm teaching you. And I say, you're following my teaching. You're like, okay, great. You're the teacher. I'm supposed to follow your teaching. But then look at what else you have to follow. Look at verse 11. You follow, verse 11, my persecutions and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I have endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The mission is to make and train disciples and all the cards are on the table. I'm telling you, as I articulate that mission, it entails and involves of necessity suffering and persecution. Everybody who takes up that mission suffers in some way. For Paul, he suffered imprisonment, being bound in chains. What is it for us? Well, we suffer. I don't know if we'll be imprisoned for trying to make and train disciples, maybe one day. But what suffering is it involving for us? Even within the church, on a, in a simple way, 
this is probably the case that this week some of you have a friend in this church who is suffering and because you love your friend in this church who's suffering you are suffering with them you wept you cried you fasted you prayed and you suffered for them within the church and then certainly outside of the church there's this challenge to suffer because we're going to be persecuted if we claim the name of Jesus and, do, and declare that he's the only one who can save the endurance of a soldier here's the challenge to you from this illustration the challenge to you is this expect suffering stop avoiding it expect suffering stop avoiding it by refusing the call to make disciples stop avoiding it by being a spectator and instead embrace it the illustration of the soldier the illustration of the athlete the illustration of the farmer they each suffer because they work hard you know who doesn't suffer a spectator who sits on the bleachers they don't suffer they just sit there but the call to make disciples belongs to the church and so we're willing to suffer to carry out that call with faithfulness after all it would be easy to share about Jesus with the whole world if everyone in the world was very eager to hear about Jesus and to lavishly reward anyone who would tell them about Jesus then it would be easy and we wouldn't be persecuted even within the church even within the church it would be easy for me to love everyone in this church if everyone in this church figured out that their goal in life should be to make me happy I'd, 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 be, I'd want to be surrounded by those people so that I could love them. Problem is, nobody in this church has figured out that's the goal of their life yet. That's the way people are. And so it is difficult to love people, even within the church. But if that difficulty makes you quit, you're missing it. We're so wimpy sometimes, we're so mousy sometimes that we stop before we even really begin. We're so afraid of relational friction and, and fallout that we don't even share about Jesus with our unbelieving friends because we don't want to endure the persecution. And the fear of the possible persecution silences us before we even say the first word. We need to be ready to embrace this. And be bold. After all, I would rather go the hard way with Jesus than the easy way without him, wouldn't you? I would rather walk a lonely road with Jesus than be in fellowship with the crowd and have their approval but not have Jesus. I'd rather lose everything and gain my Christ than not have to give up anything by way of persecution and suffering, but by so doing, let go of Christ. Endure suffering. That's the first illustration and the challenge. The second one, the soldier actually gets two verses here. So the second one comes from verse four, the focus of a soldier. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. The point is that a good soldier in active service just keeps it up all the time. He's not allowed to call time out. He's, he's not working a nine to five job. I just read... Uh, a story in the news that uh, are the, we're, we're re-escalating in Afghanistan. Some of our troops are being called back to service. Even when you're on leave, if you're, in, if you're a soldier, even when you're on leave, at an instant, they can say, no, you have to be back in. And when you get back in, when the commanding officer says, you have to go do that, you're not allowed to say, well, make the other guy do that. It's this focus of a soldier, total commitment, this is the call of Jesus. We hear this call of Jesus quoted so often in the Gospels that it fails to smack us upside the head like it should. Jesus actually says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
This is the focus of a soldier, to please the one who enlisted him. The word that's used for it here is entangled there in verse 4. No soldier gets entangled. This is a good classic Greek verb. It's used in the classic literature of someone who's walking through a forest or a field and they get tangled up in the weeds and the vines. It's used in classical Greek of a runner or someone who's running, say, in the marketplace and because they have on a long robe that, they're, that, that they're, their legs get entangled in that long robe. Don't be entangled. What it means is to become involved in an activity to the point of interference with other more important activities. That's what it means. To become involved in an activity to the point of interference where it gets in the way of other more important activities. As committed Christians, it's our call to make and train disciples. And so we don't have the privilege of getting too involved in other activities that would stop us from our calling. Entangled is a good translation because this verse isn't saying to avoid immoral things. That's coming next where it says the athlete must compete according to the rules. What this verse is saying is avoid entanglements. Maybe things that aren't wrong in themselves, but things that you know and I know just suck away too much time and they drain away too much energy and they are irrelevant to the main calling in our lives. Thomas Guthrie, the old pastor, gave this challenge to his church. If you find yourself, and I give this challenge to you in this moment, if you find yourself loving any pleasure better than your prayers, if you find yourself loving any book better than your Bible, if you find yourself loving any house better than the house of God, if you find yourself loving any table better than the table of our Lord, oh, dear ones, beware. So what's the challenge? The challenge for you to take on this week is simply this. Consider your habits. Consider your pastimes. What do you do if you're not working every night from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock? How do you spend your time? And cons when you consider all your habits, I'm not saying you need to give them up completely, but as you consider your habits, can you say this? I like it, but I can leave it. I use it, but it doesn't use me. If you have any doubt about that, simple, isn't it? Just try to stop that habit for 14 days and see how it goes. I want you to get to the point where from your soul, your simple declaration is, the only thing I cannot give up is Jesus. And I've worked with people long enough read my Bible closely enough to know this whole thing's not going to work if I'm just up here telling you, quit doing these things, quit doing these things, quit. If you remove something, you have to what? Put something healthy in its place or you're just going to crumble. So look at what the text says. Verse 4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. I'm telling you, you get the opportunity to please Jesus. Your ears get the opportunity to hear him say, well done, good and faithful one. And he won't be talking about Mary or Martha or Job or David. He will be saying that to you to please him. This single-minded focus. When was the last time you heard yourself say, I remember the last time I heard myself say this. When's the last time you heard yourself say, oh, I should be in bed, but I like this, whatever it is I'm doing so much, I'm just gonna keep doing it. When's the last time you heard yourself say that? And over what did you say that? Netflix? 
The problem with that one is you're probably watching it in bed on your phone. It's like a double bind. Was it a, was it a concert at Summerfest? I mean, I remember when, when I was dating Amy, the, the, to get to go out and to get to talk together, it's like I never wanted those conversations to end. I still want that in my marriage. Um, but when was the last time you're like, I know I should be in bed, but this, I'm so engaged by this, I'm going to keep doing it. What I'm saying is you can have that kind of feeling in knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to others. That's what this is all about. It's sweet and it's so worth it. Next illustration and, and challenge is in verse five. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. What do you think of when you think of an athlete? In this verse, verse five, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You should think of athletes who break the rules. The uh, International Olympic Committee is actually meeting this weekend about banning Russia. From my understanding, Russia is already banned from the track and field uh, portion of the Olympics. But there was a state-funded and sponsored doping going on with their athletes. And so what the meeting is this weekend is, should we ban Russia completely from the summer games and the winter games? That's what this verse is saying, you can't cheat. Nobody's gonna win the prize who cheats. This verse is easy to understand. It's just hard to undertake. This is not a confusing verse. It's saying God wants you to quit disobeying his rules. It's not hard to understand. God has written commandments. And God's kind of saying to you, it would be a good idea if you quit breaking my commandments all the time. That's not hard to understand. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. It's just so doggone hard to do that we pretend we don't understand it. It's a call to moral obedience. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27 is the cross-reference here. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after having preached to others, I myself should be a Akimos, counted and found wanting, disqualified. Obedience requires saying no to yourself, denying your flesh. This is, this is the gospel of grace. Our text says in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look up in chapter 1. Look at verse 9. You can't miss this in verse 9. It's about grace, not about works. Look at verse 9. God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So it's by grace. It's not according to works. And it's not like God was waiting for you to obey him enough and then he could save you. That verse says God saved you before the ages began, before you did any works. So salvation's by grace, not by works. But once we're saved, it's our desire to obey and honor the God who saved us. Do not miss this. Do not miss this. As we champion the gospel of grace, do not miss this call from Scripture. Your moral behavior matters to God. He's intensely interested in your actions and attitudes. And what he's looking for is conformity to his holy law. Because that is good for you and that glorifies the Savior who bought you. The challenge is obvious, isn't it? The challenge from this illustration is simple. You need to ask yourself the question, where am I breaking the rules? What is my besetting sin? What is my besetting sin? 
and you need to name it and you need to confess it and you need to flee from it. Flee from it. Run, flee. Don't negotiate with it. Don't taper down. Don't let it down gently. Flee. Take radical steps of obedience. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, for the night is gone and the day is at hand. Let us walk as those who have been redeemed. The obedience of the athlete. And then you look at verse 6. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. The illustration of the farmer is such a good one. What do you think of when you think of a farmer? Overalls? Chickens? According to verse 6, what you should think of when you think of a farmer is hard work. Making and training disciples is hard work. And you have to stick with it for a long time. And the payoff is delayed until the harvest. The payoff is delayed until the harvest. You have to keep at it for a long time. The soldier can find excitement, danger, but also exhilaration on the battlefield. And he finds great reward because he gets a medal of valor and we have a parade in honor of the soldier. The athlete, has all sorts of, has, the athlete has all sorts of accolades. I mean, in our culture, quarterback Joe Flacco set a new record, $120 million plus 40 million signing bonus. It's it's amazing. Athletes and soldiers, but a farmer, a farmer has to work and then work some more and then work some more. And none of the farmers whom I have ever known have called a press conference when they brought in the bales. None of the farmers I've ever known have just been so busy tweeting, I am awesome at sewing things on this tractor. They just do it. When's the last time you saw someone running up to a farmer for their autograph? I want a selfie with this farmer. I actually got to meet him in real life. The, the, the farmer works at sunup, until sundown and he sows the seed and what the text is saying is this is what it means to make and train disciples don't look for the payoff right away but look for hard work right away Amy and I have good friends Sue and Chuck who run a farm just a couple of weeks ago we were like we miss you we want to get together can we have dinner their answer to us was well we can have dinner like if it rains two days in a row really hard then we can go to dinner but until then it's probably not going to happen okay they, they got to work and work and work faithfully. But look at what it says. The hardworking farmer ought to have the first share of the crops. It's hard work, but it's worth it. In making and training disciples, I'm telling you. Making and training disciples who make and train disciples, you, you're, you, you won't be able to stop from tearing up when this happens you introduce someone to Jesus and then they know Jesus and then you watch that person whom you introduce to Jesus introduce someone else to Jesus. You have a spiritual grandbaby and you just pop your buttons with with joy and pride in what the Lord has done. It's hard work of sowing and planting and waiting but it's so worth it. So the challenge, the challenge for you from the illustration of the farmer is simply this. Where can I sow the seed? And where can I sow the seed means what people? Think of sowing the seed as you think of this challenge. Think of it with your right hand and your left hand. What people within the church can I sow seed with? And then what people who aren't in the church yet? within the church, who needs encouragement, who needs exhortation, who needs service from you. And then outside the church, who's not in the church yet? And you can sow some seed. Someone you know who isn't a believer yet, you can share some scripture with them. Just just write out four verses from scripture and share them with that unbeliever this week. Invite them to church, share with them 
Where can I sow the seed? So as we see these illustrations and these challenges, where do we get the strength to, to really get this and live it out? And that's where we come finally to verses 7 and 8. Remember and reflect on Jesus Christ. Verses 7 and 8. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. The only way to have this endurance of a soldier and of a farmer and the discipline of an athlete, the only way is to say, the strength is not in me, but it's in remembering and reflecting on Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, think over what I've said. And verse 8 says, remember Jesus Christ, meaning the more you think through who Jesus Christ is, his body and blood, what he has done for us, the, the deeper you go in thinking about that, in reflecting on that, the more strengthened you are for the calling that he's given you to say no to sin and to say yes to your true mission in life. And I love how it says in verse 8, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you just have to stop, take a deep breath, and see how sweet it is, those two words, remember Jesus. I love that it doesn't say, remember the resurrection or remember the substitutionary atonement, or remember the gospel, as important as all those things are to remember. It says, remember Jesus. Remember his eyes. Remember the blood, his hands and feet, the gash in his side. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus, for he is the soldier who endured unto victory. Remember Jesus, for he is the champion athlete who ran the race and won. Remember Jesus, for he is the farmer, faithfully sowing the seed and the Lord of the harvest bringing it forth. Jesus is the most noble and courageous soldier who ever suffered in battle. The gospel says when the day drew near for him to be taken up, the gospel says when the day drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face like flint to go up to Jerusalem and be killed for us. The Bible says in Ephesians, as a soldier, when Jesus died on the cross, he led captivity captive when he gave the gifts of salvation to men. The Bible says in Colossians 2 that on the battlefield of the cross, Jesus Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to open shame, and triumphed over them on his cross. The unforgettable 110th, quoted so many times in the New Testament, the Lord God says to the Lord Jesus, sit at my right hands and your enemies will be your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion his mighty scepter. He will rule in the midst of his enemies. The Lord will shatter kings in the day of his victory, in the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations. The valleys will be filled with corpses. He will shatter all the kings of the earth. He will drink by the brook as he lifts up his head in victory. Jesus Christ is the soldier who pleased the one who enlisted him. Jesus is the great champion, the runner who finished the race victoriously. You know Hebrews 12. We run with endurance the race set before us because we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne on high. He wears the victor's crown because he finished the race. And the farmer, this is perhaps the most stunning of all, Jesus not only sowed the seed, and he's not only the Lord of the harvest, but Jesus himself became the seed 
that went into the ground so that he would be the bread of life for us. John 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls into the earth and dies, it rises up and bears much fruit. Jesus Christ has become the seed buried in the ground. He's become the Lord of the harvest, bearing much fruit. His blood, his body, give us life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come now to this table, we remember you. Lord Jesus, we remember you. Amen.